All right. Awesome. Appreciate all you guys for, for tuning in live. I'm going to check the comments in just a second. I want to get us kicked off with our first speaker so that we stay somewhat, somewhat on track. You know how these things, you know how these things can go. And, um, so our first speaker, super pumped to have this guy kicking us off. You know him from CRNAspeak.com. He's the creator of the Amplify event, which is an event that helps you become a better speaker, better leader, amplify your voice in your local market. I can speak intelligently about the Amplify events because I attended one myself because I wanted to see what it was like for people going through it. And I have to tell you, it was one of the deepest, realest events that I've ever personally been to. Definitely not a surface level event. If you get a chance to attend an Amplify, highly recommend uh, doing that. Tons of other top producers, and I'm sure friends that you have in your life have also been to an Amplify. And so make sure that you get a chance to attend that. You can check out those events at, um, at crenaspeak.com. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Rene Rodriguez. Thanks, thanks for kicking us off, man. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you giving us a, a platform during these times, man. Otherwise, we'd just be sitting there at home. So I appreciate you putting all this together. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, really excited to be able to deliver this value to people. It's going to be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's important right now that, you know, we've, <clears throat> these are different times and, you know, the overused, unprecedented time, but this is, this is unique for all of us. And I think anytime you have a unique time like this, it, there's all sorts of choices that we have and how we respond and love seeing that you have chosen to respond by doubling down and pushing what you've been teaching all of us, which is to communicate harder push harder and continue, continue, continue to add value, man. And so it's an honor to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I know, you know, one of the things that you've been really good with your lighthouse series and some of the stuff that you've been putting out there, just same, same thing, right. Is it kind of like finding your voice and uh, being a rock, uh, you know, a word that's come up a ton is certainty. And so, you know, what's your take right now on, you know, kind of being a leader in you know, the market and the, the place kind of the way that things are today. You well, know, I think that, you know, for, for me, it, it, it's, it, this isn't the first time that I've lost uh, everything. When I say lost everything, you know, like, I, um, we, you know, I do close to a hundred events a year and, and they all canceled. And so that's, that's a, that's a pretty interesting change. And so looking at how do you, you know, everybody says, well, transition online. I said, well, that's a completely new business model. And I haven't been doing selling courses or events online. And so we looked at it as, well, this is going to be a, a short term, relatively short term period of time. And so how can we add as much value to the marketplace during that time and really not try to sell anything? And so to me, we looked at it and saying, okay, the things that I've been studying, researching, teaching, speaking about are about how do you lead during difficult times? Because it's easy to lead when, when times are good. I mean, anybody can. Anybody can be cool when there's no stress. And then you watch somebody under a little bit of stress completely dismantle who they are and can become maybe an asshole or a jerk, or they start lashing out or blaming. And I think that we are defined as leaders, we're defined as parents during the difficult times. And in my last article, I wrote that, you know, as Emerson said, that adversity does not build character, it reveals it. And so <clears throat> I want to get past all the cliches because I've used them all, right? And I've got 25 minutes with you. And I wanted to dive into some basic fundamental behavioral things. Because if we're talking about leadership, we're not talking about quotes and inspiration. Quotes and inspiration are means by which you achieve leadership and leadership is about influence. How do you influence behavior? And right now there's an influence battle in the marketplace. You have one group of people saying that this is the worst case scenario. This is everything that could be and all this stuff. And you have a, another side of group of people are saying the complete opposite. And then some people that find themselves somewhere in between, but everyone's battling to see who's going to win and who's going to be right. And so the leadership challenge is who can influence behavior and thought. If I can help you, guide your thinking in a certain direction, maybe towards being proactive in business, taking responsibility for the things that are around you and doing what you can. That to me is, is how I look at things, right? And so, you know, Steve Harney, one of a, a dear friend and some of the people, one of the people I look up to most, said he made a 45 day, I think 60 day commitment to, to sleeping two to three hours a day. And his goal was to, to turn the tides through communicating research and information. And you saw this guy just delivering knowledge after knowledge. And the thing that I want to say, if you're listening to this, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, there's, there's people that are going to be on this podcast or on this, this training that have a lot of influence, maybe have a lot of reach, or maybe are lucky enough to have a platform that, that we can speak on, but we all have the ability to influence. Even if it's just your family, that is one of the greatest influences that you have. 
And, you know, one of the things that I'll be looking at kicking off here is, you know, parent leadership. What, what, what are we teaching our kids during this time? Are we running and hiding? Are we showing apathy during this time? Are we showing alarmist behavior? What are we doing during this time for our kids? Because they're watching us <clears throat> a lot younger than I think a lot of us care to admit. And so the thing that I want to jump into is give you a model to sort of frame up what is driving our behavior right now. And how do we look at influence and what is the thing that's getting in the way? And so I'll let you talk for a second while I switch over to the studio. Yeah, sounds good. And if you guys haven't seen Renee's, Renee's Lighthouse series, definitely go to crenaespeak.com slash, I believe it's crenaespeak.com slash Lighthouse. Yes. And, and view the whole series. I mean, he's got a really great uh, video um, about the brain <clears throat> and sort of how you can affect the brain, as well as a video called Papcar which is pretty neat on how you can actually be going out, taking action right now versus uh, being, being stuck with your, with your hand, head in the sands. Absolutely. Can you, is the, we've talked about before, there was a little bit blurry. How's it looking right now? It looks great. Great. Perfect. Just, we just, just chime in if it does get blurry. So this is a, a model that I have used for, since I can remember, and it's something that is so critical and so fundamental that I wanted to deal with and talk about it today because we can't deal in leadership. We can't deal in how do you work in turbulent times unless we understand how we behave under stress and what is it that dri is driving our behavior and then how do we start affecting it? And so if you look at this model over here, we, we, we look at results. Anytime I'm doing coaching, strategic planning or something, I start with results. What, and not results that you're looking forward to create. What have results have you created right now? What does it look like? And those results typically come in two forms. One is what are your biggest accomplishments? What are the things you're really proud of? Because those are results. And then we look at what are your biggest disappointments? Because those are also, unfortunately, results. And so as we look at these results, we know that the next question is where did the results come from? And they come from our behavior. And so when we look at behavior that leads to the results that we have, we've got great behavior that leads to the good results and the accomplishments. But then we also have behavior that we would call disempowering behavior that leads to the results that we don't want. Regardless, we have to look at those behaviors. Now, the typical approach that people take is when they look at the results and they don't like the results that they get. Remember, our job as leaders is to get some level of result, and that doesn't always mean financial. Sometimes the result is getting people's mind to shift in a different way, but it is results driven. The leaders aren't made by what they say they're gonna do. Leaders are made by what they actually accomplish. And so we have to understand this. So if we don't like the results we get, we all know we typically try to implement some sort of change in behavior. And if we can implement change in behavior, we get results. Now, Nick, you know this is better, as best as I do. We know there's a formula to make a million dollars in this business. It's simple. You do X amount of activity, X amount of marketing, and you watch the results, you adapt, and you get results, and you follow a conversion ratio. It'll lead you to that formula. Each market changes a little bit, but by all, all in all, it's basically the same exact thing. So if we're not getting the results we don't like, then we try to implement, here's the change, do this, do this, do that. But yet we already know the outcome of that. It's not new behavior. We actually typically run into resistance. And I think that says resist. For me, my study has been around, why is it that when we're looking at positive change, things that need to happen, why does our brain typically resist? So right now, anytime, if you're communicating something, whether it's a post on Facebook, on Instagram, maybe it's an opinion, and maybe that opinion is the opposite of somebody else, why is it that they're resisting that idea? Why is it that when somebody posts an opposite opinion of what you're thinking, why is it that you resist that idea? It's important to understand this concept. And for us to be able to understand this concept, we have to understand this concept called system one and two. It's down here. I want you to think about your brain as having two systems, okay? You have system one, which is a very quick to respond, very fast acting brain. So it, it sees something out of the corner of your eye and it's gonna move out of the way. It takes very little information and makes quick judgments out of it. You're walking down the street, you see somebody, somebody that looks a little bit shady, you might decide to walk across a different street or turn around and go a different direction. It's an unfair process, but critical to our survival. It's no different than when we see a, a post that's against our beliefs that we immediately make a judgment. We see somebody that reminds me, of, reminds us of somebody else that we didn't like or trust, and we immediately make a judgment. That is the purpose of system one. Now, the challenge with system one is that it, most times it's absolutely wrong. It's incorrect. And so I'll, I'll give you a little quiz, and I want you to answer this out loud as soon as I say this. How many of each animal did Moses bring on the ark? 
Now, two. if you're like most people, right? Like Tim, or uh, uh, like uh, Nick, he said two. Now, I could battle with you on, you know, whether it was one, two, or zero, what you believe, but I already know the answer is zero because it wasn't Moses, it was actually Noah. And so the brain works really interesting when it's functioned out of system one. It takes Moses and Noah, contextually very close, two old men with beards in a long time ago, in the Bible at some point, and I said, how many of each animal? All that context puts together a much quicker response, which would be two, instead of listening to the actual detail, which is saying, I actually said Moses, which wasn't even around or alive during that time. And so that's how our system one works. And so when we think about rationality in leadership, and especially in turbulent times where we call stress, I just call it stress because I look at how the brain interprets turbulence, how it interprets uh, adversity, difficult times, it's just a lot of stress, a lot of cortisol running through the brain. And if I can understand that stress response, I can understand any kind of change, whether it's a coronavirus or whether it's a recession or whether it's a job change, it's all happening in the brain the exact same way. And so when we look at the system one versus a system two, which is the battle between these two brains, system two is a slower part of us. It's the more human side. It's the one that can answer what's 12 times 487. Now, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I could put on a pad of paper and a pen and figure that out. We're the only species that could figure that equation out. That system is what makes us different from the animal world. But the challenge is that these two systems are constantly fighting for who's in charge. And so what makes it in charge or not? It's the amount of stress that we're under. So changing behavior increases the amount of stress. System one comes in to fight against that stress. So I want you to think of system one as like a superhero. And that superhero shows up to protect us against stress. Now, if you're like me, when I was in college, when I was in school, procrastination was kind of the norm. And let's say I told myself this time, I'm gonna get it done. I'm gonna get this thing done. I got two weeks to get this paper done. And I sit down to start doing the paper. And my stress level goes up. And it goes up and it goes up. And now the superhero system one shows up and says, hey, looks like you're stressed. I got a great solution for that stress. I'm like, yeah, what is it? Do it tomorrow. You got two weeks, man. Why don't you relax and enjoy the night? And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I do have two weeks. And I let it go and immediately the stress is gone. So system one feels like it did its job because from a brain perspective, too much stress equals death. And we're supposed to avoid stress. That is a survival mechanism. And so the next day comes along, I'm ready to start that paper again. And all of a sudden stress goes up. System one shows up, it says, Hey, I got a solution for you. Put it off and it happens over and over and over again. And then it's the night before the test. Now, here's the difference. My stress has shifted. It's not about doing the work. My stress is now about showing up that day, not having done the work. So guess what? Our good old friend system one shows up and says, hey, looks like you're stressed. I'm like, yeah, dude, you made me wait till now. He goes, well, I got a great solution for you. Stay up all night and get the thing done. You got it, man. It's only one time. You can sleep later. Sleep when you're dead. And I end up staying up all night long and I get that paper done. The scary part is that I do somewhat okay on that test, which teaches the system that procrastination is okay because I waited, got it done, and I still got by, which is a reinforcement. We all know that if you feed a dog after it does something, it reinforces the behavior. And so if that happens, that procrastination is that self-fulfilling, uh, self-reinforcing process, but yet we're still looking at trying to make change as leaders. We have to understand this connection between system one and system two. And if you understand more about this, I'll drop a link in, in there. Um, and we got finished. There's a great book that was written called Thinking Fast and Slow. It was Dr. Daniel Kahneman. He actually won a Nobel, Nobel Prize for behavioral economics, looking at the behavioral side of economy, economics. Now, before I go into this next piece, Mike, um, hey, what's up, Michael? Good to see you, brother. Uh, Nick, how much time do I got? Uh, let's see. We got about uh, six, maybe uh, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. Six. We start a little bit late. Minutes. Yeah. So like, <laughs> let, let, let's say 10 minutes. Let's say 10 minutes. Okay. It sounds like you're on Cuban time. Like, like I like to be, I can, I can do it in, in the, I want to make sure we stay on time because let's make sure that we get everything here happening on time. I know some people are trying to plan their schedules. So this going back to this, cause I don't want to make this overly complex. Okay. Cause I will go a lot deeper in this in the lighthouse series, which please go to see Renee speak forward slash lighthouse and watch those are all for free. But changing behavior to get new results actually leads resistance. So the thing that we have to look at, and this is the part that most people don't look at, is what is 
it that drove the behavior in the first place? What is this thing that drove that behavior? And that is our beliefs. The things that we believe are what drive our behavior. The things that we value. Now, sometimes those beliefs are actually really good, really positive. Like I believe during tough times, my brain works better. It is my time to step up. If that's my belief, guess what tough times happen? And I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna come in and do something about it. But what if I believed that money and rich people were bad? And I've got Nick Carpenter teaching me how to make a million dollars. But my parents told me that making money and people with money are shrewd and they're selfish and they don't care about the world. So here you have this fundamental belief, yet somebody asking you to engage in behavior that goes directly and against that fundamental belief. But usually this fundamental belief is hidden to us. And so we don't know why we resist. And so when we're talking about turbulent times, what we're saying is stressful times, lots of cortisol in the air and means that a lot of people are in system one. Now, if you understand system one and system two, study the Navy SEALs. In fact, we've got one at the end, uh, our buddy, Andrew Paul. We had this conversation years ago that anytime you get to be an elite performer, elite athlete, elite professional, Navy SEAL, professional athlete, it's not about training anymore. It's not about what you know how to do because everybody in a professional athlete and in the, in, the, in the NFL can probably run the 40 within a couple tenths of a second difference. It's about how well you actually perform under stress. Does your body perform? It's not about know-how because you did all that work to get to this elite level. Now, if you're an elite loan officer, if you're a presenter, if you're a speaker, most of us have had a speech ready to go and we get on that stage, we see the, the whites of their eyes and all of a sudden something happens and we freeze. Well, that's a stress response. And so your success especially as a leader, is not about just what you know. It's about your ability to perform under stress. And so what a great opportunity that we all find ourselves in to really reveal who we are, what we're ready for. If you find yourself getting stressed and paralyzed by stress, well, we know where to begin with you. You have to learn how to manage your own stress. You gotta go and explore what in the world did you learn as a kid? What, what happened to you growing up? What is it, this philosophy that is driving that? And maybe there is a chemical imbalance with you. Who knows what it is? But it is your job as a human to take on that endeavor at whatever cost to figure out what that is. If you find yourself going silent and being kind of like, yeah, nobody's really listening to me. Well, then you're making a huge mistake because everybody's watching you. Whether it be a smaller audience, a bigger audience, your kids, your neighbors, your spouse, the people that work for you, they're watching the posts that you put on there. Are you the humorous? Are you the gesture that's constantly joking no matter what? Constantly joking and no matter what I know, if I wanna know what happened on the Tiger King, I could just ask you. Well, whatever brand you decide to act from during this time, you better get used to that brand following you for about the next 10 years. That is a message that I want you to hear from this is choose your brand because there's something really magical that happens during stressful times. Our brain is that much more sensitive to ingrain brands, ingrain situations. We were, when we remember where we were when 9-11 happened. Maybe where you remember where you were when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up, your first kiss, whatever it was, those times where massive changes happened, our values were connected, our brain begins to look at everything and pay attention. So during a time like this, how are you showing up on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter? Are you contributing to helping people look at the situation in a more positive, more productive manner? Or are you contributing to the stress? Are you letting yourself be pulled in by the allure of likes? And so you ask stupid questions that are completely insensitive to people that have lost lives. Because there's a lot of stupid questions out there. Just because you want to get in, get, well, it was just a question. Bullshit. We know why you did it. Don't be stupid. So who are you during these times? Because whoever you are right now and whoever you're deciding to be, get used to that for the ten, next 10 years. If you were the jokester, if you were the one that was the alarmist, and after this is all done and you try to give us some sort of inspirational leadership, doesn't make any sense. What happened to the jokes? I was waiting for a joke. I was waiting for some alarmist conspiracy theory from you. And now all of a sudden you want to try to inspire me? I think I wrote in my article, it's like that kind of out of brand response is almost like finding your cereal in the, in the cupboard or your, your, the milk in the cupboard or your cereal in the fridge. It just seems out of place and doesn't make any sense. And so if I had one message for you, if I just had one message to you, is decide what your leadership brand is right now. 
Decide who you want to be under stress. Remember that your kids are watching. Remember that those around you are watching. And remember who you are during this time is how people are going to see you for the next 10 years. And so I hope that that resonates somewhere with you. And here's what I got to tell you too going forward. Nick, you have an incredible lineup of just top producing people, thought leaders, people that are just incredible. I'm just so impressed with the people that you lined up. And I'm hoping that you can see their content through some of this information to ask yourself and listen to them. How are they showing up? And how can you take something that they've done and incorporate it into your daily life and your daily routine into how you speak, how you post and how you act. And so again, that's, I think I'm at my time. So I want to make sure that I'm respectful of that or any questions or things that you want to cover, Nick. I don't know, he wasn't expecting that. No, I, uh, yeah, sorry. I had me, I was just looking at some of the things that people said, like Ted Canto, he was saying, yeah, for sure. People were, are always going to remember, you know, how you made them feel right. And that a lot of people are putting out fear and lack of empathy. Um, Eric said, Oh, sounds like a tie down. Uh, let's see. Always be in, in integrity. You'll never have anything to keep straight. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody seems to be loving it. And guys drop a comment. Let us know right now, you know, what's your number one takeaway from what you've heard from Renee so far. And let us know what, uh, you know, what's your number one takeaway and everybody put your link in there. See Renee speak.com slash lighthouse. So everybody has access to that series as well. Awesome. I'll be, I'll be hanging around brother. And uh, again, kudos. Thank you all for listening. And I, and I hope that you guys take this and go do something with it. Don't just listen and be passive and go to the same stuff that you've been doing before. Just take one thing, just one thing and go do something with it. We'll see you guys Absolutely. on the other side. Thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate you for being here and getting us kicked off for the Mortgage Living Legends Summit. You are a living legend in your own, in your own right, man. So thank you so mind. much for being here. <laughs> <laughs> my own mind. Just, 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 just lie to me. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, brother. All right, Renee. We'll see you. Thank you. What? What? <laughs> you know, it was a, a slow but steady incline, and I just wasn't sure what was next or how to take it to the next level. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Milo Draven. What I do on social media is I'm unapologetically and forever just me. You know, I got inspired. I joined Lolo and for a long time I was on the outside of the internet box that we're in, in, in the group. And slowly but surely I started to feel like I belonged. Don't be afraid to show vulnerability. It doesn't make you gay, trust me. That's not it. It makes you human. And the more I became active in the group, the more my business grew because you get inspired by other people's greatness. So it, it's been a great thing for me.